In my neighborhood growing up, there was a shop that served my favorite ice cream. Unfortunately, a frozen yogurt chain opened right across the street. My favorite shop didn't last a year. I suppose when presented with ice cream or yogurt as a tasty snack, most people went with the trendier and healthier option. Competition from the yogurt store drove the ice cream shop out of business because they shared an extremely similar customer base. As it turns out, the fate of my poor ice cream shop is similar to a basic building block of theoretical ecology. Charles Darwin's foundational work talks about how the struggle for existence is a driving force in life. A key struggle organisms face is competition from other species. Lions and hyenas overlap in prey items, causing conflict. Species of trees compete over space and resources in the soil like nitrate. Microorganisms compete for a variety of tasty chemical compounds. In these examples, species compete because they have shared interests. They utilize overlapping resources. But how similar is too similar? When will one species drive another species to extinction? Or as we say, when will one species competitively exclude the other? When does a species end up like my poor ice cream store, driven out of business by a highly similar competitor? Answering this question will lead us down the vibrant history of community ecology. The first step in our journey leads me to a very basic building block of ecology called the competitive exclusion principle. This principle is to establish when shouldn't we expect competing species to coexist? When is coexistence not an option? There's a handful of videos and documents on the competitive exclusion principle I found online. They all go something like, this. Two species that require the same resources cannot live indefinitely in the same habitat. The inferior competitor will be eliminated. In fact, we have what's called the competitive exclusion principle, and that essentially means that you can never have two different species filling the same niche at the same time. A better way to say that is that complete competitors, in other words, two species that are in complete competitions, doesn't even exist. It's like a fairy tale. The competitive exclusion principle describes situations in which one species is eliminated from a community because of competition for the same limited resource. There's always some variation of two species cannot occupy the same niche. Complete competitors cannot coexist, or two species cannot persist indefinitely if they have the same resource requirements. Some frame it as an empirical result that we don't find complete competitors in nature. Others frame it more fundamentally that species cannot coexist if they have the same resource requirements or occupy the same niche, a term we'll get to in a bit. These videos and explanations aren't wrong at all, and their definitions of the competitive exclusion principle are correct. But they strike me as a bit imprecise. Why can't species share the same resources? What underlies this result? By the end of this video, it's my hope you'll have a clear understanding of exactly what the competitive exclusion principle is saying and why competitive exclusion occurs in the situation in which it applies. Most competitive exclusion principle lectures begin talking about a famous experiment by Russian scientist Gregory Goss, which more or less established it in the 1930s. However, later work makes it quite a bit easier to understand. I'll be talking about the competitive exclusion principle based on a paper by David Tillman that I find to be a particularly elegant integration of theoretical and experimental results. Simplifying matters a bit, the heroes of our story are two species of diatoms. Diatoms are single-celled plankton which use photosynthesis as their main energy source. Diatoms are extremely important. They produce a large proportion of global oxygen, and relevant to us today, they take in billions of tons of silicon from the waters throughout the world each year. Why do they take up so much silicon, you might ask? Well, the cell walls of diatoms are made up of silica, and very often the rate-limiting resource of diatom reproduction is the amount of silica or silicate in the water. If there's not enough, the cell walls of new diatoms can't be constructed, so they can't reproduce. Tillman and colleagues took advantage of this feature of diatom physiology to test what happens when you place diatom against diatom, a phytoplankton battle royale in a competition for silicate. The competitors, Astrionella formosa and Synedra ulna. Diatomes were put in a flask with all the nutrients they needed. They were continuously supplied silicate throughout the experiments. First, they grew each diatome alone and kept track of the population density of each diatome species 
and the concentration of silicate. The y-axis of these plots show silicate density in green, astronella density in red, and synedra density in blue. The x-axis shows time, so we'll see how each changes over the course of the experiment. You'll notice that each diatome density and the concentration of silicate come to a constant stable level. Diatome density increases and silicate concentration becomes relatively low. But in general, they both form stable, healthy populations. Before we move on to the competition experiments, let's interpret what the balance of silicate concentration and diatome density really means. The diatomes need to take up a sufficient amount of silicate to reproduce. It takes some time to absorb the sufficient amount. The higher the silicate concentration in the water, the more they take up, and the more quickly diatomes reproduce. At the same time, individual diatomes die. Whether the population grows or shrinks depends on whether the concentration of silicate in the water is high enough for the diatomes to reproduce fast enough to compensate for mortality. The experiments start with a high concentration of silicate. The diatomes take advantage of the high concentration and reproduce rapidly. Each diatome takes up silicate. The more diatomes there are, the more silicate gets absorbed, so the silicate level drops. With a lower concentration of silicate in the water, diatomes reproduce slowly because there's less silicate for each diatome. Ultimately, the diatomes reduce the concentration of silicate in the water until the diatomes reproduce and die at about the same rate, so the population density and silicate concentration stabilizes. This is the equilibrium concentration of diatome density and silicate concentration. R star A is the resource concentration set by Astrionella, and R star S is the resource concentration set by Synedra. What's really important to recognize is that the silicate concentration set by a diatome, R star A or R star S, is definitionally the silicate concentration for which, on average, diatomes reproduce and die at exactly the same rate. Basically, the population exploits the silicate until its concentration reaches the absolute minimum level that allows their population to maintain a stable value. With that in mind, Tillman and colleagues found that Synedra uses silicate just a bit more efficiently than Astrionella, and R star S is less than R star A. So what does that mean when Astrionella and Synedra have to share a flask? That's what they examined. So begins the competition experiment. Silicate levels start off high, so both Astronella and Synedra start off doing pretty well. Then the silicate levels start to drop, almost exactly to the level set by Synedra by itself, R star S. Soon after, Astrionella decreases in abundance until it goes extinct. So why does this happen? It reflects the R star A and R star S values. Each diatome reduces the silicate level closer and closer to their R star. However, R star S is less than R star A. So once Synedra hits its equilibrium balance with silicate concentration, there's no longer enough silicate in the water to sustain the Astrionella population. Therefore, Astrionella slowly goes extinct. This, in a nutshell, is how the competitive exclusion principle works. If two species share the same limiting resource, the species that can more efficiently utilize the resource will drive the resource to a level below the minimum threshold that allows its competitor's population to reproduce as fast as it dies. Thus, unless both species are exactly equal in resource use efficiency, here R star A would have to be exactly equal to R star S, the less efficient competitor is competitively excluded eventually. This is why people say complete competitors cannot coexist indefinitely. The system needs to reach equilibrium before the inferior competitor goes extinct. There's quite a few built-in assumptions here. The situation also inherently implies that the competitors are in a completely closed system. If Tillman and colleagues continually added individuals of Astrionella and Synedra to the flasks, no species would ever go extinct. Also, in nature, resource availability varies in time and space. Different species may capitalize on resources in different locations or at different times. The competitive exclusion applies only when there is no spatial or temporal variation in the limiting resource, which, as we'll talk about in future videos, can be extremely important. 
So this was a bit of a long explanation, but I hope it gives you a bit of intuition about the underlying assumptions that go into the competitive exclusion principle, and I hope that you conceptually understand why competitive exclusion is actually predicted by it. This is not the only situation where the competitive exclusion principle is relevant. The situation I've described, where two species compete indirectly because they exploit the same resource or resources, is a very common ecological scenario, which we call exploitative competition, and we'll come back to it many, many times. Listening to all of this, you might rightfully point out, this whole situation is obviously not the norm. Indeed, in nature, species are different. They differ in factors like which resources they utilize, which predators they have, and which features of the environment they perform best in, etc. Often, ecologists will use the term ecological niche as some sort of amalgamation of all these factors, and that's what people mean when they say the competitive exclusion principle means species can't occupy the same niche. They're implying that the competitive exclusion principle applies when all of these complications are ignored. We'll talk about niches in the future, but be prepared, it's a bit messy. While it's a bit messy, it's also important. The diatomes for Tillman's study were both taken from the same sample off the shore of Lake Michigan, so it does seem that they coexist. Does this mean that the competitive exclusion principle is wrong? No, it just means that the competitive exclusion principle doesn't describe the population dynamics of these diatomes in their natural environment. The biology, geology, and limnology that make up the ecosystems of Lake Michigan are simply much more complicated than the small flasks that comprise Tillman's experiments. I also hid some interesting information from you. Tillman did these experiments at several different temperatures. The experiment I described above was done at 24 degrees Celsius. When they did experiments at lower temperatures, like 8 degrees Celsius, the tables were turned. In these cases, Astrionella was the superior competitor, and R star A was less than R star S. Therefore, Astrionella drove Synedra to extinction. Synedra does better in warm conditions, and Astrionella does better when it's cold. Perhaps seasonal temperature variation in lake water equalizes competition over the long run. Or perhaps each species persists at slightly different depths of water, with Synedra capitalizing on warmer conditions, and Astrionella flourishing where it's cold. These are just a few hypotheses which very well might be wrong. The key point is that the conditions of the competitive exclusion principle are in some way likely violated when we observe coexisting competitors. Therefore, the competitive exclusion principle doesn't describe nature per se. It gives a baseline set of conditions from which coexisting competitors deviate from. For example, people talk about the so-called paradox of plankton, the observation that many species of plankton, like the diatomes we discussed earlier, seem to coexist on relatively few limiting resources. But it's not really a paradox. We just haven't definitively concluded how the assumptions of the competitive exclusion principle are being violated. And so using the competitive exclusion principle as a basis, Ecologists dream up the factors which may explain the maintenance of species diversity, and turn those dreams into reality with a combination of mathematics and observations of nature. Well, at least we try. Thanks so much for watching, I hope you learned something. If you enjoyed, please consider subscribing to the channel. I'm going to continue on this topic of competition for a while, where I discuss some of the most interesting coexistence mechanisms that ecologists and evolutionary biologists have proposed.